Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Nice to see you. See um, everybody, some faces that uh, I'm not too sure of, but you're all welcome to tonight's cafe. And thank you very much to our hosts, Babek and Andrew and Geert, who have opened the cafe, ready for us all to um, imbibe in our new creative uh, evening tonight. And I hope you've all got a glass or uh, some coffee to drink and um, whatever else you need to make the cafe work. I'm really uh, pleased to present uh, Carol Boehm tonight. Um, I met her through uh, uh, Staffs University at um, the C3 Research Centre, where we've been doing some work. And um, she let slip uh, one, one time that she had taken up walking and that was like, oh, okay, let's talk about this. And um, when she um, had a, a fellowship or two a few years back, uh, she deliberately chose to have a look at when she was studying this idea of culture 3.0, um, how the idea of getting around a city on feet on her feet would actually help her health and it wasn't about mental health because we spend a lot of time talking about that but her physical health and that's when my ears pricked up because I spend quite a lot of time as some of you know uh, walking um, and it's it's uh, obviously quite healthy the walks that I uh, make um, but uh, Carola will be talking first of all about that and then segueing very nicely into culture 3.0 um, and talking about uh, and discussion the ideas of uh, the experience of what this means to us in in the in the future so um, from being described as uh, a practice which is um, basically chamber music so my friend Giet said, uh, but physical chamber music, um, I uh, would like you to uh, charge up your glasses and sit down at the table and light your gulwars or your pipes or whatever you do nowadays and sit back and listen for the next sort of 20, 25 minutes to our esteemed guest, Carola. Thank you very much. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes, it's going to be interesting. The, the chamber music. So I first of all, I'm going to put some windows in the right place so that uh, and I, I as I mentioned before, I will not be able to see you because I have PowerPoint on as a, a on presentation mode. So um, it's just one of those things where I, um, I I'm, I'm not going to be able to see you. So if you if you want to ask any questions in between, just uh, shout out, speak out and I definitely can hear you. Um, and I have to say, as Jess said, and thank you so much for, for that introduction, um, it, this is actually a new one uh, for me because I've never incorporated the sort of health, the walking, and then also I'm going to talk a bit about running. I've never incorporated that into, I guess, what I could call my academic work, which is much more about culture 3.0. So this gives me an opportunity to get my head around it, see if it fits, and then see what learning I can do from uh, the walking art kind of community, are there synergies, are there kind of explorations, and of course, hopefully there will be a discussion at the end in relation to what this all means. So I'm, I'm as, you know, as Jess said, I'm Garola Böhm. My research area has always been arts and higher education. Uh, specifically, how do universities use art to become more permeable, to communicate to societies outside of its boundaries, these kinds of things. And um, so the structure of my talk, in short, is I am going to talk a bit about me, just just three little things about me, but that gives a context in which these culture walks that uh, Jess also hinted at are actually situated in. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the walks. And, and then, as Jess said, I'm going to go into culture 3.0 because it's a concept which is actually not quite well known. But I think it helps uh, a lot of individuals who are culturally engaging with having the confidence to actually um, uh, you know, even, you know, ask for public funding, asking for investment. It's a different kinds of um, cultural engagement. And you will see what I mean when we get to that. 
point. And then, you know, we'll come to the typical question. So what, you know, what's the value of this? And then, of course, this discussion exploration. So three things about me, and this already shows a bit, this is a virtual me, so you already probably can tell where this is a bit going. I do love a bit of a good tech, uh, and so I, I do use some of my connectivity via the means of technology. So this is where I was exhausted, but uh, this is, of course, also me. I'm an academic. Arts and higher education is my area. And, of course, that means also thinking about how the communities within the university and the communities outside of the university actually can be connected or how we can connect them. Then, as I mentioned, I do love a bit of creative tech. Uh, my actual background, educational background, is actually music and computer science, so both arts and sciences. Um, so also I had to deal with the interdisciplinary quagmires. I had to deal with the gaps that, you know, you're falling between the chairs, but also two chairs that one might sit on. Um, but with that, of course, I love a, a bit of tech that connects us. And again, you know, where it took me from walking, and I'll go into that a bit, into running, it, it also using tech to, to give me motivation to, to, to keep on doing what I'm doing. So, so uh, I have to admit there will be a bit of uh, talk about tech as well. And then, as Jess said, I started my journey um, as... Uh, <laughs> There is a longer journey here, which actually started that as, as a young adult, I was uh, uh, an intensive cyclist uh, and also kayaking and also climbing. And then I uh, had a condition, which is Hashimoto's, which is a hypothyroid condition, where, which was undiagnosed for uh, 10 years until I was diagnosed. But by then I was completely overweight. My, my social life was completely gone. I couldn't do anything on the weekends. And so there was this long recovery. And doing that recovery came that time where I said, oh, I'm going to start, uh, I, I'm going to link somehow my everyday academic work to the need to walk. And from there, I then went also on to running. And uh, I put this slide up because I would class myself not quite as a walker. So, so there is a bit of a caveat because I have to admit, I love running now much more than walking. And I've never found the real love for walking, uh, for better or for worse. It probably would be better for me if I would like it more. But uh, I, I do identify myself as a runner, an ultra slow runner, and I'm known in those communities as CBDB. So that's also something very interesting. There's, of course, a whole virtual community, whole virtual connectivity there. And uh, uh, that sort of social networking is, is, is based on Health Unlocked. It's a system where uh, the NHS, you know, the NHS was actually the founder of it with a couch to 5K, you know, learning how to uh, run through a sort of run-walk program with, with intervals of, rowing, uh, of uh, running and walking. Uh, but that is the community that helped me get from walking to walk, running to running. And by the end of it, until December, uh, I was able to run um, 10K on a weekly basis. And, and then I had some injuries because I stepped on a stone. And that's another story which comes into that. But I'm quite, I should actually say, as I mentioned jokingly before, Jess probably walks double fast than my fastest run. So I am a very, very slow runner. And there's even a specific style. It's it's the sort of Japanese um, slow um, running style of Tamaka, who's invented it from Japan. Uh, so I am very very slow, I should say, but I would actually say I'm deliciously slow. So that's that's the the sort of background um, uh, also to the walks. But it's an intriguing one because it it also means uh, something. You know, the motivation comes out of the connectivity. The motivation comes out of uh, the places that I encounter, whether virtual or whether real, and that will feature in some of the slides as well. And so, as Jess mentioned, the background to the walks is, is a level one fellowship that I received. And this was um, uh, before, before the lockdown, so before the pandemic. And the basic question for me was, why do we need university housed art schools? And of course, I always had an intuition of why we need, you know, you know, art departments in, in universities. But I wanted to get the evidence there so that we can justify it better. Why it's so important for us to have arts degrees, arts centers in universities, arts provision in universities. And the idea was to go to two places that are famous for that. Um, so Turku in Tampere in Finland and Aarhus in Denmark. 
and uh, I managed to stay two months in Finland for this work. And of course, I did typical things like such at interviews and um, literature reviews, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm rather going to talk about something else. But I should actually say that the second trip, Aarhus, I actually had to flee Aarhus in Denmark back because the day after I left, I suddenly had to book my flight back. Uh, Denmark uh, um, went into the first lockdown. So this, this was slightly disrupted um, through the pandemic, but it gave me a sort of different perspective, which is actually quite important. But as I said, for this kind of uh, research, the, the basic background to it is, of course, this notion that arts and culture pays dividends. And as somebody who's there on hand, is the CEO of the Arts Council in England, actually. He said, sustained strategic approach to cultural investment pays big dividends in all of our lives. And then you have, you know, creativity, learning, feel good, innovation, play shaping, enterprise and reputation. You know, these things are probably not important for our context, but just to, to highlight the, the benefit of that. Because actually, in my physical physical activities, I have to admit I'm I'm pulling the creativity along to give me more motivation in order to uh, continue with my physical uh, activities, including running, including walking, including um, other things. And of course, you know, the one thing that people sometimes forget to mention is that culture and arts is linked to innovation. So you can actually there's evidence that those cities. Um, that have the uh, largest numbers of people engaging culturally in arts are also the ones which have uh, the biggest sort of economic growth, the biggest uh, uh, economic resilience, uh, if you so well. So, of course, culture and arts uh, builds capabilities for innovation. It's, it's linked with these innovation systems because it questions one beliefs and world views. You can get acquainted with cultural diversity. You, you learn to appreciate transformational impact of new ideas and, of course, it builds new expressive conceptual skills. So, so that was the basic background to this kind of research. So it's much more on the arts and culture side, but you will see where it goes. Just one last quote before we leave that standing to the side. This is um, Luigi Sacco, the bottom quote, which, which I really like. Culture is a social software needed to manage the complexity of contemporary societies and economies and all of its manifold implications. And of course, we, we can almost see that, how that worked out in the pandemic, because you know I always say that if governmental policies kept us safe, it was actually arts and cultural engagement, even online, which kept us sane uh, to a certain extent. So let's go to the walks. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the idea, and I should actually, and I'm, I am going to do that just now, I'm going to, in the chat, I'm just going to bring you up, in the chat, I'm going to, if I can find the chat, like here, oh, no, I, I probably have to do it afterwards, because if I'm sharing, I oh, here's the chat, yeah. Uh, I should be able to send it. So there is a Twitter thread for later, so you can, uh, you know, use that for later, or uh, or can uh, um, just copy it just now. Um, the culture box I documented in Twitter, um, the culture 3.0 box, and the idea was simply, oops, the, the idea was simply to understand if I walk daily from my place where I stay overnight to the place where I uh, go to work every day, and do I encounter creativity or arts and culture in a way that allows me to understand how creative the city actually is. I'm going to go into the culture 3.0 concept a bit later, but if you think about everyday creativity, you know, understanding that um, creative lives are about engaging with things that are on, on your walk that might um, uh, sort of be classed as, as, as creativity. So that was the idea. And I'm just going to show some slides of this Twitter thread. And I put the, you know, the, the address of the Twitter thread into the text so one can still see it. Um, and I'm just going to pick out some. So as Jess said, actually, there was a sort of uh, second day notion for me to want to do this type of research because it would allow me to actually choose an apartment which was 35 to 40 minute walk away from the university where I would go every single day. That allowed me allowed me to afford myself to do that walk every day. But at the same time, I wanted to then engage in the research that I was doing. So would I see, could I see how creative the city actually is in terms of everyday creativity? So I would step out of my apartment and I would document through, through my smartphone, through 
videos that I talk through, audio that I talk through, pictures that I talk through, for instance, here, one can see that immediately um, when I stepped out of my apartment, I saw a comic book store, uh, I saw a board game uh, shop, uh, then I crossed the street and I saw a shop of a dressmaker that made dresses made in Stoke, and then at the bottom right, there's just a bookshop um, as well. You know, going on, you see second day, um, uh, secondhand stores, which sold just lovely little pottery. And you get the sense of, you know, you don't even have to ask if this is art, but, but you're culturally engaged because I was looking into the windows and I was thinking about how is this different from UK porcelain? And actually, this looks a bit more like German uh, cups and, and uh, saucers. And then, of course, at the bottom, the movements feature quite big in Finland, of course, because they were created movements. So there was a lamp shop with movement shaped lamps um, in there. Um, and it allowed one to think about the, you know, creativity and, and through, through, the, through the act of walking. And of course, there were these big structures as well, you know, some gorgeous architecture, big theater, theaters, but also graffiti or murals uh, that were on large surfaces that you encountered. And Turku in Finland has a lovely river, actually, that goes all the way um, to the place where I then, then worked uh, almost on every day. So you cross the river also at certain places, and you can see that they use the river for some almost like an exhibition space as such. Like these, these funny um, ducks, uh, big ducks, which were floating on the river. But also in the top left, you can see actually the railing um, and in the Twitter feed, of course, you can look, you, you can click on one picture and it goes uh, a bit bigger, but you can see almost that the railing is, is made out of glass panels. So it was actually beautiful. It gave you this sense of safety while you were walking across it, but at the same time, the transparency that allowed you to see through that. Um, so all of these things you could pick up and you could also ponder while you were walking about things like the connectivity between these places. You know, how do you connect that place? And Turku had an integrated transport system from uh, uh, scooters to uh, bikes to uh, a funicular to the buses to a ferry, and all of it was all of it was actually provided by the city transport organization Furli, which was actually owned by the city uh, council. But it allowed me to connect those places even on weekends when I was going to. It allowed me to engage culturally so much better because there was this connectivity that gave me a sense then while I was walking and documenting that, that's the, the, the lived embodied evidence and experience that transport matters for cultural engagement. So for, for my work, that was, was quite crucial. Here again, just going down the river walk, of course, you see sort of the, these industrial scale settings and in front of them really large uh, sculptural um, uh, figures like the top left, but you also see you know, so you suddenly discover at the bottom right, you discover these tiny hand-sized little um, things that are creative when you start to look out for them. And so, so of course, I was looking out for those. I, I wanted to have that Culture 30 lens on, so everyday creativity. Um, uh, and, and of course, I probably saw more than if I hadn't done that. Um, and right almost at the end of the walk, there is the Maritime Museum and it has this gigantic daisy. And of course, I went in and they had loads of things. Of course, it's like a tourist shop in there. But again, you know, I spent quite a long time looking at the pictures and looking at even the towels that had certain designs on. And again, in a sort of different kind of context, you would ask, well, what is this art? But, you know, this is where we're going to go to, because I think this is where the Culture 30 concept comes actually in. Uh, and at the top left is a sort of tray of the Apicalago, uh, of the map of the Apicalago. And I actually spent two days on the Apicalago but actually in the museum at that time, during that walk, I went in and I must have spent at least 10 minutes just looking at that map and then I finally bought it. But it's now a very dear possession of mine because I discovered it in this context. I, I hooked that up to a sort of cultural engagement and one might argue about that, but um, we'll see if that works by the end of the talk. These are almost the last slides. So there is when I um, uh, come to the university where I was working every day, it's actually to the left of the left picture, you actually see, see still this industrial um, age chimney uh, and they have neon lights on there of the Fibonacci series. So again, it's just a little bit of creativity winking at you just before you go into the building. 
And of course, at the bottom right, you know, the, just the sort of sense of the culinary arts. Of course, you know, you can do culture with, with food as well. Uh, that's just to document that. So that was the Culture 30 walk. And this is just the, the section that I did in Turku. And it allowed me in a 30 minute sort of uh, time span to understand how, how, how policies of the local authority or of the government have influenced this city's creative prowess, if you so will, or, or cultural prowess. And so I'm going to go in the next section into uh, the sort of culture 3.0, because it, I think it's quite crucial to understand it in this context. And I want to understand it in terms of my walking and my running as well. And that's hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this community and the, the discussions that we've had has already helped me with that. But in short, this is a concept that Luigi Sacco put forward. It's quite new. And Luigi Sacco is an Italian professor of cultural economy. And in short, if you think culture 1.0, patronage, culture 2.0, copyright, culture 3.0, co-production, you're probably right. But let's delve into it a bit because there are some nuances in there that are really, really interesting. Uh, and of course, on this slide, you can also see that the sort of focal centers with culture 1.0 being Europe, culture 2.0 USA, but I would say UK as well, and culture 3.0 Asia. So this, this image just shows very, very clear what we can imagine of uh, culture 1.0. It's a sort of classical patronage. And with the classical patronage comes limited audiences. You've got gatekeepers. So the cultural offering is determined by a patron's tastes and interests. There are no structural markets. And of course, it has what we call value absorption. So the money invested in, in putting this on has to be created elsewhere. And of course, that's why we call them patrons. They, 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 they might be magnates, they might be industrialists, they might be aristocrats, but they make the money elsewhere and they, they put it to place to, to put on arts. But of course, I should actually emphasize that it's not just historic, it's happening now as well. So you could see the BBC Proms or a classical concert, piano concert, also as a patronage model. It's just that the patronage is not done by the aristocrats, it's done by a public, for instance. So you have public patronage, for instance. And in Luigi Sacco's system, that's culture 1.2. So he has 1.2, 1.3, and these kinds of things. I should also note quite often, I've got a bit of a Stoke reference because of course I'm based in Stoke-on-Trent, the potteries, which makes a lot of ceramic stuff. And the sort of culture 1.0 uh, example that I have here is this, this decorative plate, which was done by Kirby for a patron who wanted it. And you know you can see that there's money melt elsewhere and there's no other purpose to it. It's not utilitarian in any way. It's, it's a culture 1.0 type of plate. Moving on to culture 2.0, we of course see here that suddenly we have technological innovation. So if you think film industry, music industry, you're absolutely right. We've got technological innovation that supports mass production. So the copy paste, we can copy things, digital uh, reproduction, unlimited uh, reproduction of creative content. And we have suddenly very large audiences that produce a significant turnover and profits. And of course, you know, the examples here, of course, Dave, David Bowie representing the music industry, Star Wars representing the Hollywood, the film industry. And oh, this is a train. Uh, I'm living just outside of a train station, actually. And then on the top right, you've got uh, the sort of more contemporary type of culture 2.0 with augmented reality. So this is this was Leviathan. You can almost see the audiences behind this veil, and they have um, you know 3D glasses on, and they see this veil swimming between them. So you do have very large audiences. You do produce significant turnover and profits. And of course, if you think about it, many of various government strategies are all hung up on culture 2.0. And that's what I actually suggest, that um, Luigi Sacco has always said that Europe is being held back because it's hung up on culture 1.0. So the innovation is not as good as, for instance, US amount of innovation. And he's saying it's because we're hung up on 1.0. So there's too much money going into culture 1.0. I'm saying that the UK is hung up on culture 2.0. So basically our UK government wants to build the next Hollywood in, in, in London, basically. Um, uh, and, and I think that's great. It makes a lot of money, but it's not the future. So it's, it's the presence. It's not the future. So now we're going into culture 3.0. And I think culture 3.0 is really crucial also for walking arts or arts and walking or, or uh, these kinds of things. 
Uh, and that's where, where Jess and I started off from, ah, this is an interesting concept and what does it, you know, what, what, what does the walking art community actually make of it? So Culture 3.0 uh, is, is very much about co-creation. You still have ubiquitously available of production tools. So I could, of course, record my song in my bedroom with the tools that I have. I can upload it in SoundCloud and I can use uh, Patreon to, uh, to make money from that. So mass distribution of content without mediators. You've got open platforms, you know, like SoundCloud, uh, like YouTube. You, you have a blurring of who's the producer and who's the consumer. So, for instance, at the bottom right, of course, there's online gaming. And uh, with m many of those online games, there's a lot of content produced, you know, of people creating videos from playing them or creating podcasts from playing them or creating posters. And that is redistributed in the community, whether that's being sold or shared for free. But you can see that suddenly it blurs of who is actually the producer, who's the consumer, who's the artist and who's the audience. And then does an artwork start? And then does it end? And so there's also instant diffusion and circulation. And I should actually emphasize the picture on the left um, because uh, there's always this notion that Culture 3.0 has something to do with technology. And yes, it's made easier by digital technologies because it creates that connectivity. But you can have Culture 3.0 completely without technology. So on the left is a, the Lost Carnival, which is a sort of festival, which I actually experienced in 2017. So it was a two and a half day outdoor festival. And yes, it, you know, it, it had dance, it had music, it had storytelling, it had circus art. And of course, you could, could go only there for two days. But if you stayed there for two and a half days, you were part of the narrative. So the audience was woven into the storyline that you could only understand if you stayed there for two and a half days and you had right at the end, almost like you were part of a whole book, you were characters in the book. And uh, there was a whole conclusion uh, at the end of it. And that's very much immersive. And of course, that's very much culture 3.0. And of course, at the top right, and this is me now again as a sort of physical being, uh, by that time where I was taking that picture, I went, of course, from walking to running. And as I mentioned in December, I stepped on a stone and, uh, and I have a sort of metatarsal fracture. So I, I moved to the indoor rowing community, which is a whole nother story. But I, I identify as a runner, so I, I hooked, hooked up my tech in order to row a runner on this virtual environment, which is Swift. And if you look really closely, there are some runners right at the back end. Um, so I'm obviously faster in the digital world than I am in the real world. But there, there is a sense of community in there as well. There are people who can chat. There are people you can connect. And of course, there's a sense of beauty and the, the world that you run through or walk through, loads of people are walking these on treadmills uh, as well. So you get a sense of connectivity. It's a different kind of sense of connectivity in place, but it is a sense of connectivity. But going back to this culture 3.0 kind of context, you know, and you can imagine that social media feeds into that co-production is often being seen as much more democratic because now everyone has, is on the same level. Everyone can participate. And of course, there are no predetermined market channel bottlenecks. Um, uh, and, and as I mentioned, you do have that um, uh, connectivity as well, the digital connectivity. So with that comes this blurring of active and passive participation. And that's why, again, it's very interesting for the sort of physical uh, uh, communities as well, uh, because you can be much more easily active rather than just an audience member which sits down and watches a play for, for two hours. Do you have these open communities of practice? And that conforms very much to my experience with that online running community. When I went through the couch to 5K um, uh, kind of process, it was very much this, this community of uh, co peer co-runners which helped me through the time of getting used uh, to, to running for 30 minutes. Uh, it has networked organization, massive shared and shareable production of content, instant diffusion and circulation. And so the production of value, and this is again important, the production of value moves to the social domain. And so you can see here, culture is a collective sense making. And with that, it connects to all main dimensions of civic functioning. So innovation, welfare, sustainability, social cohesion, lifelong learning, social entrepreneurship, local identity, soft power. So all these things are being said that, that are all there. And so some of the examples here, if we start with the woolen cladden piano right on the right 
for, for me, that's again such a great example of Culture 3.0, because many people would say, well, but is this art? And I think, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you would apply uh, to the Arts Council in England for installing woolen clad and piano all over the cities, they would say, no, it's not art. It's not quality art. And the nice thing about this question is that now I don't have to say whether that's art or not. I just say it's culture 3.0. It's a way of culturally engaging. I can play the pian piano. I can listen to somebody else play it. I can rub my hand over the wool that just feels lovely. And so I'm culturally engaging in some way and I'm getting all the benefits of being happy and of, of being connected, of, of, uh, uh, of feeling, you know, feeling that this was a rich experience. Um, so this this is a great example of culture 3.0. But in terms of me as a sort of walking and running being, the, the sort of middle example, um, and I think we had at, at, at the last cafe, we had somebody who really walked from Land's End to John O'Groats. Um, and so I had to put this image in because I'm also running it at the moment, but of course I'm running it virtually. So I'm running locally in my own area, in my little roots, and I'm putting the kilometers in, and you can see loads of other people who are doing just the same. And with that, I get the motivation to slowly run my way virtually up, but running physically locally up the spine of the UK. So it's again, it's a different kind of experience, but of course you can ask yourself, you know, this, this is the blurring of active and passive participation. So everyone is really, really active. So who's actually, the participant here, you know, is, uh, we are all sort of creating this community, which is there. So in, in short, um, Culture 1.0, as I mentioned, um, uh, the centers are Europe, Patronage, Culture 2.0, the centers are US and UK and copyright and Culture 3.0 co-production. And moving on, why this is important is, uh, as I mentioned, Culture 3.0 has this potential to be much more impactful than, than actually culture 1.0 and 2.0. And I should actually emphasize that I don't want to do away with culture 1.0. You know, I want to go to a Bach concert or a Beethoven uh, piano concert. Of course, we don't want to do away with it. And I'm just arguing that we have to balance the investment to have a, 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 a certain amount of culture 3.0 uh, 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 in, in, in the mix, so to speak. And of course, just to name some other terms that are very much often linked to culture 3.0, whether that's community arts, participatory arts, everyday creativity, so that all fits in. But you know, it's sort of my choice to use culture 3.0 because it's a much more rigorous conceptual model. And so just some examples to, to the end and coming back to the walking and the running is that, you know, I, I'm of course, am based in Stoke on Trent. And Stoke on Trent, I find, is really, really strong in the sort of participatory arts and culture 3.0 kind of context. So the organizations who do um, activities in brownfield sites, that's the bottom right. The activities that have pop-up radio studios in side grass verges. Um, so top left is actually not, not a building. It's actually an open space kind of place, uh, which is the same as the top right, you know, where they just pop up certain creative activities in certain areas where everyone can participate. And again, you know, the nice thing is it's not about quality, it's about engagement. So, you know, for me, it's a cultural 3.0 kind of engagement. So as, as, as I close, the, the question, that's the, the main question for me, of course, is, okay, so, so I've just engaged in, in now three years of uh, beginning to identify myself as a physic, much more physically active person than I have for the last 10 years, so to speak. So I identify myself as a runner, and, uh, but I connect online and virtually through that. And of course, I'm also digitally creative to keep my motivation up. So, so you, you know, the, the, the spine, the end-to-end the -end job on the left, but also, you know, the, this various Outback 10K routes, that was me buying an app, uh, deleting everything that the map that the map gave me and just uh, giving me the 10K routes. And there is a bit of beauty engaging in, in this potential of running for me, this potential of uh, the excitement that you have when you discover something digitally and you know you're going to then experience it physically uh, as a run or, you know, or as a walk for those who, who walk. This is again just an image of me now moving on to rowing a runner because 
by by the time in December, as I mentioned, I, I couldn't run anymore until my I'm now ready to start again, but I probably have to do couch to 5k again. But again, the, the beauty that is in these spaces and, and they are not like the real world and they're but they do connect you. There are chats there. Uh, so I do I have to say enjoy that much. And of course, I can live through that in, in a small way that I can't in real life. So this is actually the North Coast Virtual Challenge 500 Challenge, which goes alongside the whole North Coast. Now, in my younger years, I wanted to cycle it and I never got around to it. And then I got my condition. And as I said, until three years ago, I couldn't walk longer than 30 minutes. That was my limit and my back was killing me. So that was my limit. So I knew that the North Coast Challenge was completely, utterly beyond my ability. Uh, but as one of the things that I did during various lockdowns is to sign up to this virtual challenge and run again locally. I run locally and I put the distance in and I see that because it's hooked up to Google um, uh, Satellite and Google World Map. And I experience the places that I would run through if I would run it there. And for me, there is a real joy for that. And that joy gives me the motivation to run. But of course, I'm running locally. And running locally, of course, I then also engage creatively, like I see these little things like this fairy house, which is part of my run as well. So in, in conclusion, I think for, for me, but you know, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Because I'm I'm coming sort of to to the conclusion that it's not just about how culture 3.0 is is you know is my city. It's for for me personally. It's almost like how culture 3.0 is my life. And when I put these things together, I sort of realized that um, that actually uh, the the whole sort of digital enabled running journey is also a journey where I attach my creativity and my virtual connectivity too, in order to also keep me motivated to do the physical activity. Having said that, I really enjoy my running. So it's, it feels like it's, it's you know, there's almost no uh, uh, no barrier there. And, you know, and I also get, you know, as, as Jess said, I should talk a bit about the health benefits. When I do run, uh, and as I said, I, I run more than I walk. So I really love my running. I get these day long runners highs, which just don't stop. Um, and I can feel that uh, immediately. So when I don't run for three days, I get a bit clumpy and then it's, it's there and it's not there. And if I run, then my feet are warm at night. And if I don't run, my feet are cold at, at night. You know, it's really like night and day. Um, but it's um, for me, of course, there is this, you know, how does it connect to culture 3.0? And I think that gave me a chance to explore that a bit. So I would love to to hear what you think about the culture 3.0 context and how it relates to walking arts. Well, thank you very much, Carla. You managed to squeeze a huge amount of um, brain power, and I know you have a brain the size of a planet. So to squeeze that into something that somebody like uh, me who uh, who can understand that's fantastic. Simon Cole has a question or a couple of questions, three questions. Um, I don't know, Simon, do you, do you want to just talk this out or are you just happy to have them in the in the chat? Well, um, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, well, actually, um, there were more observations, really. So I just uh, when you were talking about uh, version two of culture. I was thinking about Walter Benjamin uh, as walking artist. That we're all familiar with him, uh, and the age of mechanical reproduction. Um, and then when you were talking about the participatory um, angle, oh, I thought I turned my video on. Um, when you're talking about the participatory angle, um, it just made me think about um, participatory performance art. Um, and so I, I guess I was just when you were talking, I was just light bulbs are going off about different uh, labels and, and definitions and Venn diagrams. But then lastly, also, I, I, you know what, what you were talking about, it's been really on my mind um, lately when um, I was thinking about all the different things that I do and I've always struggled to kind of knit them together. But now I kind of see it almost as the, the German concept of the Lebenskunstler which is that yeah. the way the way you live your life is can be like a sort of form of of, of, of art 
so I'm fascinated by that, I that idea of the last slide you left us with. Um, so can you say a bit more about this idea that almost like everything you do in a way is is your art? Yeah, and you know, and, and that concept is for me, it's it's the quintessential thing of culture 3.0 because you know it you, you have this notion of just how can we make our everyday lives much more creatively? You know, that that's about it. How do we make our place more creative? How do we live more creative lives? It's it's as basic as that. And we do have actually, and I did actually, I didn't put it in, we have one colleague who I respect so immensely and just might know her, which is Anna Francis, based in Stoke and Trent. And she actually um, is a community artist, she would say, until she, she encountered this Culture 3.0 concept. And she suffered for the last 20 years, as many community artists did, because it was perceived to be a lower art form um, and it wasn't really funded as much. But she actually got a community together uh, and the community persuaded the, um, the uh, local authority to hand over an old pub. And then the community, they, they did everything together. They co-create everything together. They didn't know how to create a business plan. They got an expert in that taught them uh, how to do a business plan all together. And, and they created an event which was called uh, uh, learning how to do a business plan for those who don't know how to do a business plan. And they all learned together and they created a business plan. They got the money for renovating it and they're designing it with an architecture. They, they identified an architect that works with them for them to be able to co-create the design. So this notion of co-creation, but this notion of we, we, we don't just want to consume art. We want to be part of the process of living it and living much more creatively. Uh, so I think that that fits so, so much into what you're saying there. And I think some of the things that you mentioned also in terms of participatory performance art, that of course is very much um, linked to that. And with that comes, of course, suddenly the resurgence in outdoor arts. Now, of course, outdoor arts in the UK has had a massive increase during COVID simply because of social distancing and these kinds of things. But I think it also sped up our understanding that Outdoor arts is, from my perspective, is very much culture 3.0 because outdoor arts tends to go where people are rather than people have to come where the art is, is supposed to be. You know, so, so it's taking it completely out of the institutions, which in some ways strangle some of the art to keep it inside, you know. So, so there are things going on which are really interesting that, that I find are easier to class as, as a sort of different way of culturally engaging. And it sounds like the, the sort of the, the living artist, the Lebenskünstler, the, you know, these kinds of things fit in really, really well, which were niche until some time ago. But actually, when you look at also how young people identify and they have an alternative identity they have um, online and they live these identities, um, then, then we see that there is a step that is happening there. Uh, and sometimes we don't recognize it because it's so digitally distanced from our cultures when we grow up. But it's happening digitally enhanced, certainly. Uh, but there are loads of things that happen not digitally enhanced that, that are along those lines as well. Yeah, fascinating. And of course, yeah, Walter Benjamin, of course, age of mechanical reproduction. That was the beginning of Culture 2.0. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. That's some very good um, observations and questions to get it going. Anybody else? I've got something to say. I can't get my vision on. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm a performance artist, and um, I always bring the sexual element in, oh. i.e. my body, my nude body, in, a naked body, in running, walking situations, because it tends to energise the situation. Uh, I don't know if that's cultural, but it's very uh, oh. creative. <laughs> Well, I think, Robert, just, just to add some context there, because um, Carolyn doesn't know the, the, your story that, as a performance artist uh, of some quite well um, renown uh, in the 70s and the 80s. So um, that, that, that sort of uh, is quite important um, to, to, to your question, give some context. OK, I was in Los Angeles for 10 years, 72 to 82. And I, um, it was quite violent. Chris Burden was 
crawling on his back across glass. And the choices in the late 60s were either self-mutilation or sex, basically. And I didn't want to cut myself, so I, I uh, used my own body as a, as a tool. And I think this is sort of, the idea is, uh, I, 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 uh, um, uh, I did a self-portrait with a just a jock strap on. And it's about the hypocrisy of clothed men painting naked women behind closed doors in Renaissance time. So I took away the gallery walls. I got thrown out of art galleries. I got screamed at McDonald's. <laughs> but it's just basically breaking down preconceptions. And it's kind of, in a way, sort of um, situationism that we own everywhere we go. Our bodies are unique to us. And we can put those bodies, because they're our bodies, in any situation we choose to. Is that yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I do think, you know, and of course, you know, you probably will know much better than me that there are artists who use the body as the, as, as the, you know, as, as the thing on which the art works, whether that's even uh, uh, changing their body forms through us aesthetic means and in some ways and in small means, you know, you could even consider tattoos being uh, uh, along those lines. But of course, there is a whole subculture there that 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 uh, engages in that kind of identity and also artistic expression where the body is part of that canvas that that expresses your um you know your your identity well all then my age she had plastic surgery on her face she had a nose made much bigger and things around her cheekbones and stuff like that so yeah you can actually and someone else what he grew grass out of his back, a Chinese guy, and various things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. or uh, I forgot what the name is. It was sort of an interesting one because he, he classes himself a musician, and I know the music field better, but I forgot what his name is. But he actually puts um, sensors into his body because he wanted to feel that what it was like to be controlled by the internet. And then he gave the sensors, he hooked its sensors up to the internet and allowed people to move. He's, Say it again. He, he, uh, I don't know him personally, but he another one he did, he had meat cleavers in his back and hoisted it up by a big crane and he was scared of his guts falling out while he was <laughs> doing yeah. it. He, he, he died recently, I think. But, um, oh, did he? Who oh, was he the partner of? Oh, that, the, 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 the Yugoslavian woman, Abramovich, I think she, she uh, piled yeah. up with him for a while. Yeah, but, you know, that's, that's well, uh, yeah, no, so... Yeah, it's an interesting one, and and I think you know, and I guess it, traditionally it would be classed, and you you know, you can tell me how how you were classed in relation to that into the avant garde. Um, no, I'm on the outside of the avant garde. I've never been included in anything, basically. Right. And it was yeah. a non-artistic approach to art that we adopted in the sixties, and not to uh, announce that it's art. So. You know, I'm not even in the avant-garde, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. totally but I annoying. think where the connections are is, as you say, that it's much more, you know, this is where the connection to Culture 3.0 is, because it's not about producing art, it's about being and living. Absolutely, art. absolutely. Yeah, it's about being, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, Robert. Uh, Andrew, you put your hand up and so does Giet. Andrew, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Carola. Um, I was listening to something today, which was um, a podcast which involved the uh, cellist, Natalie Klein. And um, she was asked uh, whether she felt she was creative. And uh, she said, no, no, I'm, I'm not creative because I'm not a composer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm re, I'm a recreator. And of course, our vocabulary gets quite over this because, um, uh, you know, that, that we could slip into recreation, couldn't we, that word there, which would mean something different. But um, I thought what was really interesting about uh, kind of what you're saying is that I would have thought the musicians would be leading on cultural 3.0. And you can probably fill me in on this because, you know, vast majority of people use other people's work to recreate something and they uh, absorb an energy from the audience to which they're uh, they're playing for or playing with, you know. And I would have thought um, more more so than the digital, uh, you know. Uh, obviously, digital helps in in that in in, in different ways. But uh, something that Natalie Klein was saying was that uh, y y you know the 
the numbers of musicians who through the pandemic struggled because yeah. they weren't performing in public yeah. and and they lost that uh, ability um you know they managed to do something online and they managed to but but she said that you know um by playing compositions of other people it with other musicians in a public sphere is recreating it's not um so i was just, just thinking that seems to be quite pertinent for what yeah. saying yourself, that you're a musician yourself so you could probably We can't hear you, Carla. We can't hear you. Oh, right. Okay. So, um, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's good. It's just my. <laughs> This is typical, isn't it? I've got uh, advanced technology here. I've got a mixing desk here, which is even advanced because it turns off after eight hours of n n not doing anything on it, not you know doing the faders, and then it thinks it can turn itself off, which of course it can't. So, but you know, I was going to Andrew, I was going to comment on that because I think it, it is interesting. The um, the t this discussion about um, uh, interpretation. Or the creative, how much creative input you have as a as a performer when you interpret somebody else's piece, that that is quite a long-standing discourse in in that area. And I do think you're right that actually the consciousness in the music field is quite there because we've had these discussions for longer. But it's rather only the consciousness and not the culture of doing it. So the culture of doing much more culture 3.0 is actually much more with uh, specifically outdoor arts. And I think the reasons for that is because music is so old and established, it always had patrons. So you have, you know, music is the longest uh, discipline uh, available in higher education. So, you know, the, the first music in, in universities was in Vienna in, in, in the 19th century. So a music practice in academia, you know, whereas of course dance, we only started to have dance in, in universities, you know, recently. So it has the longest patronage model in higher education, uh, but also in terms of the big institution, concert halls, it has the biggest, most expensive institutions that hold it back into a culture bond ponzio model. Whereas of course those arts, whether that's you call it community arts or, you know, music therapy, you know, that had to, uh, grow in the cracks of where funding was available, they they started to to rather flourish in the areas of where they could just co-create and co-participate. And that's, you know, quite often it was outdoor arts, which struggled for a long time and um, only in, in the recent decade uh, was perceived to be a substantive, uh, worthy of investment kind of uh, initiative. But again, you know, you look at the taxonomy in the Arts Council England, um, certainly, and you can see music and dance, but you look for outdoor arts, it doesn't appear, you know, so that there are still these struggles. And I think the struggles are actually between these ideologies between culture 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you, Andrew. Geert, you're sort of desperately needing to ask a question, I can tell. Yes, I'll uh, be desperately needing an answer, but I don't know if I'll <laughs> get that. No, it's, it's a huge question, and maybe I just wanted to, to touch the tip of the iceberg and um, maybe extend your um, um, your topic to education, uh, the an education 3.0, um, also and specifically in, 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 the, in the perspective of outdoors, outdoors education related as well how walking or walking arts can contribute to that and how creation and the education can meet each other. I was so questioning actually the future of universities as they are now, uh, which are very traditional um, and conservative uh, um, institutions, um, as well, not only thinking about uh, the, in the perspective of collaboration, immersion, um, co-production of knowledge, um, uh, working on a more horizontal level, uh, and bringing walking as a, as a form of community, form of knowing and sharing knowledge, but also the possibility or the potential of technology in that, uh, the technology that is uh, allowing a more horizontal way of uh, yeah. teaching, learning. Um, so, uh, I know I'm, I'm just 
this is too huge maybe to, to, to get into oh, completely. I had such but, a lovely question. Thank you. Thank you. Because actually, just today, I, uh, I, I got confirmation that a book will be published, which has a chapter on that, actually. And, um, you know, I don't know if, if Piet, you and me actually talked about that in the last meeting, because I have a concept which leans on that, which is called University 3.0. And the idea for that is actually, um, and I should actually say, I'm passionate about universities, but they do have to change. So, so there is a sort of, uh, I'm, I'm quite passionate. But the idea is that when you think about the, the evolution of learning, University 1.0 pre-internet is that it was teachers or lecturers who held the knowledge. And even I remember I, I stood in front of 50 pupils and I taught acoustics. And that meant that I held the knowledge and I gave the knowledge to, to my students. That was University 1.0. We were, we were the owners of the knowledge. 2.0 is the sort of neoliberal marketized university where we packaged up uh, the, you know, the content in some formal way. But actually, we as academics inside the universities, we couldn't uh, choose a subject any, a area anymore. We had to curate specific subject areas. So at the same time, knowledge domains were expanding. And that meant you can't say you have a music degree anymore with a 20th century scholar, 19th century scholar, you know, medievalist and, and antique music. You, you couldn't, that corpus of knowledge was too large. So you have to then decide, okay, so you have music performance as a degree, you have music technology as a degree, you have music developer as a degree. You're, and, and with it comes, of course, for those people who don't understand it, the, the notion of Mickey Mouse degrees, you know, because suddenly you have music producer as a degree or live music festival organizer as a degree. But it is because the knowledge domains are expanding. However, I'm now saying that um, actually we need to get away from knowledge being the central thing that universities do, because knowledge is now all around us. We, we're so connected, you know, if, 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 you know, if somebody, if I teach dithering again, which is a sort of acoustic term, you know, within two seconds, every student could Google it and could know much more than I can convey to them. So the role of universities, and I think the role of me as an educator, is actually to curate the environment. And that comes in what, what you just said, to curate the environment in which this learning happens. That the environment includes the outside, the nature, that it includes the technology. And of course, we need knowledgeable lecturers and academics and professors to be able to facilitate the learning, but it is rather the environment where the focus has to go. But of course, most of the quality systems that we have, whether that's in schools or whether that's in universities, are based on a university 2.0 model, still this packageable thing that we could say, this is the curriculum, this is the corpus of knowledge, and we can you know, package that up and that's it. And, and I think that's wrong because we've moved on, we are now a knowledge society, knowledge is all around us. Um, so I'm not a university abolitionist, certainly not, but I think we have to focus on on, on the environment in which learning happens rather than the content. Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, beautiful what you say. I don't want to get into this too much, but if somebody else wants to elaborate on it so, or to deviate to somebody else, uh, please do so. Man. I'll yeah. Um, question. Oh, sorry, go on. Was it Simon? Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this this is. Uh, I'm so glad I I, um, I tuned in tonight um, and I bought a membership as well. Um, finally, so uh, looking forward to more of this. Um, this is great. Um, what Corolla? What what's what is the key? Is there a key practitioner? Like you mentioned curation. Like uh, are, are we? Uh, is the key practitioner now some kind of facilitator? And curator, or is this like a blanket term that all kinds of people are indulging in, whether they be performance artists, or whether they be musicians, or whether they be a, a lecturer, or is there a kind of like you know archetypal um, practitioner for culture 3.0? And if wow. so, what do they do? <laughs> uh, I have no idea, but you know, I assume there are you know some in our midst just now here. <laughs> So, um, so I would probably think there is no sort of archetypal, you know, person there. And you know, as, as you know, your, your question also points to something that you probably are aware of that you know the, the term curation has been used so extensively now that some people would say it lost lost its meaning. You know, and I don't know if it does, but um, gosh, I don't know. What do you think? 
Uh, well, I mean, this is this. I, oh my gosh, this is something I've been wrestling with because um, I've what I've been doing for a while. I kind of intuitively knew it was important and it was good, but I struggle with labels, and so nice. I've always struggled with the 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 label of artist and who's an artist and who's not. Because I see people being creative in so many different ways. Uh, you know, and not. Um, in the way they live or in engineering or entrepreneurs and think you know people like that and so i struggle a bit with these labels um and i, I guess I, I i guess i i on some level i suppose a little bit of me right because i did an arts degree and people people would often poke fun and say you know what what you're doing is all about who can spin the best line um and blag it you know and i'm wondering at what point like like who who is the artist practitioner of culture 3.0 and who is just a community, I say just, who is a community activist and then who is a facilitator? But obviously maybe, maybe I'm just going off into a sort of navel gazing blind alley and maybe none of this actually matters. And maybe yeah, it's a way I mean, of being in the world. Yeah, maybe. and I just, I think the matters, of course, is that we are still sort of torn back into culture 2.0, 1.0 systems because the, the institutions are still so embedded with that. But of course, if, if we would accept the sort of culture 3.0 kind of thinking, then we could say it doesn't matter who's the producer, who's the consumer, and we all produce and consume a bit, and we're all consumers in, in some ways. And it doesn't matter who's the artist and who's the audience and, and move away from the term the artist because we can just say we're all creative and of course but but structurally of course and you know financially sustainably there needs to be infrastructure to support that and and with that comes actually you know i could talk about that for for ages but a, a sort of co-creation kind of shared ownership you know whether, whether that's co-ops uh, or whether that's other, other systems, and I could even, you know, tell you technological means to 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 share that prosperity. And I don't know, are you actually based in Britain, Simon? Uh, yeah, I'm in East London. Right, because I think, you know, in some ways, you know, I feel actually quite lucky to live in the UK. Gosh, I haven't said that for a long time. <laughs> I feel lucky to live in the uh, UK at the moment, because specifically the Arts Council has just published this let's create strategy which is all about everyday creativity without saying it too much because of course they came from a very traditional culture 1.0 context they didn't even fund you know youth pop bands they didn't fund street arts they didn't fund jazz uh, dance you know they didn't fund those kinds of things and they moved uh, you know due to darren handley where I showed the book, you know, he, he, he actually understood it without having those terms, but um, he's moving into that area. So now is really the time to push, you know, whatever we call it, whether we call it Culture 3.0, Community Artists, Participatory Arts, but I think it gets the support of the Arts Council, which wasn't there for, gosh, you know, for at least 50, 60 years, until you go to the beginning of the Arts Council, because it was actually linked to wealth in the post-war period. So I think it's a great move um, at, the, at the moment. So, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But, you know, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like, um, it, it feels a bit like, I, I would love to to see your work because it sounds like you're, you're immersed in what I would call culture 3.0 kind of thinking. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of the rhizomatic classroom. Nice, nice, yeah. And you've you've really helped with my DYCP that's forthcoming. So thank you, I appreciate it. You've joined <laughs> you've joined a lot of dots for me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Simon. Um, Tamsin had a question in the chat, um, and it's to do with Babek. So so um, we're going to embarrass Babek now as well because he's going to be involved. Um, so uh, following on from Simon Tamsin, you've got something. Uh, that probably needs to be aired to everybody, if you can have a shot. I, uh, yeah, I just, you know, I don't, I don't know very much about the different apps that abac has been involved with and, and creating, but there's just, it, it, that work has just been jumping into my mind all the time, especially in the crossover between 2.0 and 3.0, and so I just really love to hear him 
you know, speak maybe about what the sort of angle on this is, Babak, and, and uh, how it connects. It seems to me that you've been doing something which I didn't know about, where you're trying to bring, you know, the technology and walking together and the co-creation yeah. and walking together and so on. That was it. Oh, I would love to hear about that. <laughs> I'm not going to steal the the, the show, uh, but so I'll keep it short. Um, but Tamsin is is right, um, and this for me uh, comes out of um, a background of being um, very enamored with the ideas of uh, fluxes, uh, which has two central tenets: the one the first being that everything is art, and the second one being that everyone's an artist, uh, and uh, that. Uh, uh, um, is um, uh, uh, sorry. Now I lost my train of thought. I heard myself for a second. Um, everything is art, and everyone's an artist, right? And uh, that very much ties in, I think, with uh, Carola, what you are calling culture 3.0. Uh, uh, although, actually, to be honest, what I would call this is remix culture, uh, which right. is uh, some something that uh, really is like that came up with Web 2.0, uh, where everyone also really becomes a creator as well as a consumer. Uh, and on, on the internet, what we've seen over the last 10, 12 years or so is that where for where, where 10 years ago, the bandwidth that people consumed was a, you know, an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude larger than what they uh, put back uh, onto the internet. But that has shifted more recently where we put on the internet much more than we did before, and in some cases even more than we consume. Um, because we are creators, or many people are creators, right? And we create, uh, some you know, some people create in a vacuum, but many people create based on what others have created before them. Meme culture is an example of this, where everything gets recycled and reused, right? So that's uh, this collaborative creation. But to, then to get to Tamsin's question specifically, for uh, Derive app, which is an app that I uh, run, which is actually in concept similar to one thing that Swazik also does, uh, who talked about uh, uh, her own work a few cafes ago, uh, is uh, based on the ideas of the Situationists, uh, which is about exploring public space. Um, but the app itself is built in a way that you that it blurs the line between the consumer and the creator. So when you when you start using the app, you consume. Uh, or rather the app prompts you to do things, but you are the the, the, the person consuming the content. Um, but it is very simple, very easy to shift from this and to become a creator and to produce work that then is consumed by others with, within the same app. Mm -hmm. uh, so it blurs, or at least that's what I try to do with that, is blurring the line between uh, being the consumer and being the creator. Because I very strongly believe in that this participation adds much more value to the individual eh? because when uh, when well historically we sit we used to sit on the couch and watch what the television beamed into our homes uh, and although this is changing with remix culture and people participating uh, in the creation of uh, um, work whatever it is a lot is still pure consumption. I mean, there are people who create memes, but the majority of people consume memes. There are people who create television, but lots of... Uh, <laughs> uh, Enrico is sharing the link to uh, to the app in the chat. Um, there are uh, most people... Some people create films, but most people watch Netflix, right? Yeah. Um, instead of, you know, no one builds on Netflix because also, of course, if you do that, you get the lawyers at your door and you have to... Uh, uh, answer for reusing uh, copyrighted uh, content. Um, but uh, uh, although there are people who naturally have this urge to create, uh, most of the time we would call them artists, but because I believe that everyone's an artist, I think that it's just a matter of lowering the bar enough, uh, or lowering the bar for participation enough, so that to, to nudge uh, people who are more used to consuming uh, to nudge them to also create. And in the case of Derivab, what that is, is uh, it's, it's little task cards that nudge you into doing something. Uh, and you can, you can, uh, you can you, every, everyone here can create little task cards to have others do something. Uh, and because that facilitates a higher awareness, 
uh, of the environment, you are sort of like collaboratively uh, making each other more aware through that. Right, it looks great. I'm, I'm just looking, you know, I clicked on the link, it looked absolutely great. I'm going to download it. <laughs> yeah, you should. Um, and actually, uh, uh, well, um, uh, I'm working on uh, quite, uh, well, I've, I always work on this, but there's another big update uh, coming um, around the corner, I hope within the next uh, month oh, or yeah. so, uh, uh, which, um, uh, well, and, no, it, it's... It, it, and I think it's it's good. Yeah, you know, I might actually add the the term remix culture into the the terms that I mentioned because of course there are terms like participatory arts, like uh, cultural democracy, and like remix culture, which are much better known than, than culture 3.0. I think to, to some extent, culture 3.0 goes beyond some of those terms and and is is possibly able to be an umbrella for some of them because it it also allows things where you don't copy like that theatre piece where you immerse yourself for two and a half days in a in a sort of festival, outdoor festival kind of experience. Um, yeah. So there are sort of things that, that culture 3.0 can denote, which some of the other terms like participatory arts or cultural democracy might not be able to. But um, it, it, um, uh, yeah, great, absolutely. Um, and I think- One thing that I, sorry, go on. Go on. No, oh, okay. you first. Okay, uh, one thing that um, I do, um, feel there might be an issue with, with using the term uh, culture 3.0 is the recent rise in usage of the term web 3.0. And um, web 3.0, um, if you're not, uh, uh, if you're too mainstream, you might not yet have heard of it, but is all about um, commercial exploitation, essentially. Or commercial exploitation of the elite by, uh, by the elite of the people. So the people are being exploited by the elite uh, through a veneer of, uh, um, uh, what's the right word, a veneer of uh, equality or, or yeah. equality, um, uh, e equanimity maybe, I, I don't know. Uh, so, but very much about, uh, yeah, tech feudalism, yeah, yeah, that's very much related. Yeah. Um, so to, to use the term 3.0 for culture, some people are going to you know, equate or relate this to Web 3.0, which is really about financial exploitation. Um, and that is not something I think you want to be associated with. So there's that. Yeah, it's something to, to think about. And of course, since Sacco put that um, term out in the world, you know, there's Factory 4.0, which is about automation. Um, there is, of course, Open Innovation 2.0, which was the sort of uh, um, innovation ecosystem, you know, the, the kind of stuff. Um, so, so there are loads of numbers. And of course, when I do a talk about culture 3.0, quite often the first question is, okay, so what does 4.0 look like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm gonna yeah. be clever and ask for, ask about 4.0. And then if you've got someone who's really clever, they'll ask about 5.0. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. yeah. But I was going to say, Barak, because you know the the from the, you know, the website already looks so intriguing. I have to say, of the app, so it just looks absolutely fabulous. Because of course, during my sort of walking to running journey, I you know as a tech loving kind of person, I I I tried out loads of different apps, including sort of immersive experience where you have a storytelling. Uh, that that uh, that sort of expands while you run and by running. So there's a zombie run app, which oh, people yeah. might mm -hmm. know. Which you know, when you have zombies running after you, you have you know sort of interval running, but in a immersive storytelling. But it's mm -hmm. it's now like nine years of episodes, thirty forty episodes per year. There's a whole world that you can immerse yourself, and you are runner five, and you're always runner five, and and of course the community is then engaged in that have the shortcut. So when I say I've got enough sports bras, everyone who, who is using that app knows why there are enough sports bras and you know <laughs> in various drawers. So there are, you know, there are these these worlds where you immerse yourself, which are just I find delicious. You know, they're 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 creative and engaging and they connect you with other people and you can be creative and you you you're not just reading a book you you're part of the creation of the book you know it's just absolutely lovely yeah it's of course for the exact same reason that uh, second life uh, was such a success yeah. um and more recently um what's that what's that game where you have to build minecraft uh, yeah and also why minecraft is uh, such a success because you are 
you are immersing yourself in the creative world constructed by yourself and the people around you. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah, the the new reality. Um, uh, well, but, but I have a question for you, Carola, um, which uh, uh, it, you know, which was a bit you know from before about education. Um, I totally take your point about that learning environments uh, maybe should be about the space or about mm -hmm. uh, the environment that you are facilitating, um, because that is what facilitates learning. I totally uh, am on board with that. But do you think or do you feel there might be a difference in how this works or how this can work for uh, um, uh, for sciences that are like the humanities? And scientists, sciences that are exact. Yeah, gosh, you know, uh, it comes. You know, this. The, I think the question comes down to ideological perception of knowing how knowledge is produced, um, and uh, and this notion of where you stand on that. You know, so there are, of course, you know, I don't think it makes a difference. My personal view is it, it doesn't make a difference. There are, of course, suggestions. There are some sort of knowledge that you need to convey before you can actually synthesize your own knowledge and things like that. But in terms of the pedagogical processes, it's always better to facilitate the, the learner to learn that by themselves. You know, And of course, there are asked sort of these pedagogical methods, whether that's flipped classroom, whether that's experiential learning, whether that's phenomenological learning. So there are these terms that are popping up increasingly so that I would again associate to my concept of University 3.0. I just put them all in, into that bag. And it's all about you know, where you can create an environment where the learner takes the ownership of learning rather than be a passive consumer or passive receiver of the knowledge that, that is being given to them. Now that clashes quite a lot also with very traditional cultures. But you know, I learned still in this University 1.0 way, I learned engineering and, you know, and that was brutal. I learned in Germany, you know, there were 700 people in the first year, there were only 300 people in, in the third year, you know, so, so, so I, I, I think that's not the solution, that, and especially in a time where, you know, we, we have to accept that, it, you know, for us as humans, we are getting to the point where it doesn't matter as much as what you know, but you know, also this notion of can you synthesize the knowledge, or can you know where to get the knowledge, or can you contribute to the making of knowledge by putting things together in order to create something new? So, so I have a feeling that it probably doesn't matter. I probably have to think about it harder. Uh, but I can see from the pedagogical methods, like this experiential learning, placement learning, phenomenological learning, they are being done by all disciplines, not just the humanities or not just the sciences. So there is something to it that even pedagogues are moving to that model where it's much more about the individual learner taking complete ownership of the learning. They need to be facilitated by knowledgeable individuals uh, in order to, to, to coach them towards the right direction and, and, and uh, facilitate that. Uh, but um, yeah, that's a long winded answer, but I guess my, my personal view is no, it shouldn't matter, but I'm not 100% sure. Well, okay. thank you. I, I think I'm a bit more on the fence. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Bob. I think that's probably another discussion for another time. Uh, Geert, Geert you, uh, that, that was great. Um, Geert, you had a, a, a question. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed, but actually uh, to, uh, to add a counterpoint to, to what Babak and Carola were discussing about, uh, the Socratic way of learning uh, is uh, something that is hoping that it will come back and actually the true knowledge is to know that you know, that you don't know. And um, uh, I, uh, I don't want to exhaust Carola too much and, uh, and, uh, and maybe there are some other people that want to ask a question first before I get the turn. Um, Okay. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else it... wish to say anything? Just put up your hand or just blab away. Maybe they're just too busy drinking wine and beer. Yeah, and <laughs> I see something in the chat, autonomous zones, but I can't find it anymore. That, that was, was that was that was Simon. 
then I will fire away my question, although uh, uh, the, uh, what, what uh, sort of strikes me and, and, and uh, look, coming back to walking arts uh, is uh, that in my perception of walking arts, it always has and has had and has uh, a subversiveness and a form of, let's say, innate uh, activism. Uh, even not explicit, but but implicit, and um, the um, uh, and for that reason, it is always connected with the future, with the change, with the transformation. Uh, yeah. Because by being, being in in by being in the landscape, you are you are you are sort of changing it um, uh, and uh, transforming it to your imagination. To your anyway, the um, my question is: I don't find the word activism in this uh, concept of culture 3.0, um, although it is. It seems to be so much part of it since the beginning of our century. Um, um, yeah, the, the, uh, the, does yeah. activism? Yeah. Is something that um, is culture 3.0? Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, um, I, th I think um, th the reason why I like this concept so much is because it allowed me to forcefully uh, advocate for something which, under different terms, would be politically hooked up to certain ideologies. So when you talk about cultural democracy, you know you know that certain uh, political fields will completely dismiss it. You know, so so I think it allowed me to forcefully state the same thing, but with seeming to be politically neutral, if that makes sense. Um, so it's maybe a subversive activism. <laughs> Could I come in here again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's Quine, the, the American frontier philosopher from Akron, who famously said, uh, "To be is to be the the voice of the variable," and I think that's close to what we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think so. I think I struggled, scared also with. We we had actually in the last half year. We we, we I'm part of a um, society which looks at the future of universities, and we we discussed for half a year in that society what academic activism actually means and what it could be and and where it finds itself and and these kinds of questions. And I do realize that you know we're all shaped by our own experiences, and I'm always very very much aware that I'm partially also institutionalized to a certain extent, but I'm also suffering and resisting certain institutionalizing factors. And certainly in my work, I know that, you know, I can pinpoint what happened to me personally and professionally, which riled me up and wanted to exhibit activism, but where I took a sort of abstract notion to say the same thing uh, and be able to, to, to um, propose it as as something that should influence policy, but without the dangers of, you know, of losing jobs, so to speak. So I think um, th th there is something about that that is really relevant, the question. But I do think the reason why I like that concept so much is because it's politically neutral. And because with it, it might be more palatable across the divide. And, and I think that's quite a powerful a concept that that um, is useful to influence policy. Okay, what what I think that's a, a good time for last orders um, in the cafe. Um, thanks, Carla. Th thanks, Robert, for bringing that up. Um, <laughs> I think it sort of feels sort of um, a, a nice conclusion to Kiet's. Uh, um, activism uh, 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 question. Um, thank you all for such an interesting cafe. I think we'll mm, all agree that you. that really is quite mind expanding. Um, and for everybody here this evening, uh, and I think I think it could go on and and it could affect all our our practices um, in, in whatever way that we we choose walk to be uh, an artistic statement. Um, the one thing I'm sort of still hanging back on, but I'm going to leave in the air, was um, 
Calder's first experience of um, choosing to walk in order to democratise her landscape and her experience of art. Um, and I just leave that hanging there. So um, looking forward to the next one, to the cafe owners, Geert and Andrew and Babette. Thank you, uh, Simon and Viv and Annie and Sozik and Enrico and Robert and Tamsin. And um, there we are, half past, half past eight and the cafe doors are closing. <laughs> Safe journey home and wherever you walk, may it always be comfortable beneath your feet. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you.